welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, there's been huge interest in uh, this demand response masterclass, our first one of 2022. We're delighted with, that so many of you have signed up and are going to join us. Uh, Patrick Liddy, Mark Gormley are our panelists this afternoon. Both have decades of experience in this area and they've put together a really, really interesting um, masterclass is what we call them. And I think you're all going to really enjoy it and get a lot out of it. Um, just a quick note before um, the gentlemen start off, at the bottom of everybody's screen, and we all know how this works, there's a little chat box. If you have any questions during the um, presentation, pop them in there at the end. We have time for, the, uh, for Mark and Patrick to uh, answer them. Um, I'm going to hand over to Patrick and Mark now. Thanks very much, Sinead. Um, I'll go first. Uh, thanks to you all for joining us. Um, uh, so just to give you a little bit of, about um, Crowley or C Cool Planet, um, we're a company who are focused on reducing carbon emissions um, uh, in the world generally. And uh, I suppose when we go through it now in a little while, you'll see how key electricity demand response is as part of that, allowing us to electrify and use more renewable electricity in our system. Um, Mark, you can skip on to the next slide. Now, Sinead gave it away there a minute ago. She, she said that I have decades, or we have decades of uh, experience in that space, uh, showing off how I'm not my 21-year-old self no more. Um, so yes, it's true. I've worked in electricity demand response for the better part of my career. And it's been generally um, not well known it's a very niche area. It's a tough one to explain to your mother what you do for a living when you work in electricity demand response. However, what we've seen in the last few years has it coming to the fore as a key part of how the electricity system is going to work, how it's going to work going forward, and how it's going to facilitate more and more renewables on the grid. And I'll explain to you how they're slightly different from traditional uh, generators and how uh, where they have shortcomings, uh, it creates an opportunity for electricity demand response, which is which is a great opportunity for uh, users of energy to get some money back out of the electricity grid. Um, it's a real great opportunity for you. Mark. So to start with, um, just a little 101 on how the electricity system works. So if we start actually on the right hand side is the best place to start. Generally speaking, on the right-hand side, that's the electricity demand. So us as users of uh, electricity or uh, businesses who use electricity. Now we're generally gathered up and work through an electricity supplier and that supplier uh, allows us to engage with the electricity system. So we consume electricity and that creates a demand on the electricity grid. And sitting in the grid in, in Ireland is uh, our national grid operator is AirGrid or Sony. Um, and what they're doing is they're managing that demand and making sure there's enough generation to meet the demand. And that brings you to the left uh, to the left hand side, which is controllable generation. So power stations get um, requested by AirGrid to generate more or less electricity so that they match the demand um, that's on the right hand side. Uh, just one second, Mark, go back for one sec. So their job is to make sure, uh, AirGrid's job is to make sure that the left-hand side and the right-hand side match. And ultimately then where the way the money flows is uh, on the right-hand side, we consume electricity, we pay for it. And then that flows through to the generation on the left-hand side. Um, <clears throat> And our demand changes significantly throughout the day and throughout the year. I'm an engineer, I love graphs. So let's have a look at a graph. Um, the blue line here depicts a day in the winter of Irish demand. And the red line depicts a day during the summer. So I guess the winter is the more interesting one. You can see in the morning, um, we use very little overnight um, as we're all sleeping. And then at around 6 a.m., a thing called the morning rise starts, whereby we're all getting up and consuming more electricity. And generators need to switch on and ramp up to meet that demand over the course of that time. So few generators are running in the middle of the night, and many of them are running, are, are switching on 
during the morning. And that load flattens out during the middle of the day. And then at around between five and seven o'clock, we have what's called the winter peak. So that's where we're consuming most power. Um, that would generally happen in late December, early January. We're consuming a lot of energy. All the lights are on. Everyone's cooking their dinner. Industry is still going. And that's where that peak demand comes from between five and seven o'clock. And then after that, demand begins to fall away, as we can see. Um, now, that demand is not always so predictable. So here's an interesting one from... Um, the European finals just uh, last year, where you can see the English electricity demand during that time. Um, so the yellow line shows what um, the Monday in June looked like, and the white line shows the Tuesday in June what it looked like. So normally you would expect Monday and Tuesday to be roughly the same. However, you can see a huge change here, where at half time, the people of England put on the kettle and made cups of tea. And you can see the huge increase in demand during that time. And then uh, that fell away after half time. And at full time, everyone was just fixed on the TV, not doing things that consumed more power than that. And then very quickly after that, the day re returned to roughly speaking normal, where you can see the white line returns to looking like um, uh, the yellow line. But ultimately, the system operator's job is to match these things. So when demand changes, generation has to change too. Mark, next. So <clears throat> going back to our drawing from earlier, uh, where on the right-hand side we have demand and on the left-hand side we have generators, what's changed now is on the left-hand side, there's more renewables. And more renewables means less control for the system operator. Because while you can tell um, generate uh, wind, to generate less, you can switch them off. Uh, you can't tell it to generate more. You can't magically get the wind to blow stronger. So where we come in is we work with um, flexible demand. So you can see there on the right-hand side, I've sort of boxed off a portion of um, uh, industrial demand, which can be controlled. We monitor and control that demand and make it available to air grid. So in my previous, uh, slide. I just showed instructions going from air grid to power generators, telling them to generate up and down, and we give them a new option. We allow uh, them to request demand to reduce, or in some cases increase, in line with um, what's going on uh, on the electricity system to help them balance the system. Now the good and exciting part is payments. Ultimately that means we unlock revenue from the electricity grid, and we pay that to the companies who provide that flexible electricity demand. So what sort of demand do we mean by flexible? Well, it's not generally speaking your lighting and your computers and things that are critical. Rather, it's loads which you could switch off, which have minimal effect on your ongoing production for a short period of time. So examples of that would be cement milling or pumping or refrigeration. So these are processes which are intermediate in nature. People are pumping water into a reservoir and they can stop pumping water into that reservoir for a period of time and still have enough water to keep the rest of the process going. And when they switch on the pump, they can catch up again. The same would apply in cement or refrigeration. Alternatively, on the right hand side, you can see alternative supplies. So this is where companies use their backup generators or now these days their batteries to supply their site for a period of time, reducing demand on the grid. In general, we're not talking about exporting electricity here. We're just talking about reducing your demand. And that's enough to give value to AirGrid to unlock these revenue streams for you. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna talk quite a bit about um, demand over the course of this. And I just need to split out two sort of different types of, uh, freak of demand response that, that matter. So first of all, there is a slow response um, uh, or DSU as it's called. So that's the, the top half of this um, slide. And that goes back to the demand curve that I showed you a little while ago. 
Airgrid can reasonably well predict what the demand is going to be in the next hour, and they can instruct generators to switch on or load reduction to happen. So we can give you a half an hour or an hour's notice asking you to switch on your generator or switch off your cement mill or something like that. The other part is mm -hmm. fast response. So on the bottom here, what I'm showing on the left bottom left hand uh, uh, picture is a picture of the electricity grid. And it's the traditional electricity grid where there are many power stations. These guys with the red uh, roofs, they're power stations. And the green boxes, they're loads. And if a power station has a problem in that uh, traditional system, then all the other power stations ramp up to respond to the loss of uh, one of their, their colleagues. So if one generator fails, all the others um, come in. If you go back to what I said, it's hard to ask wind to do that, to respond to a problem on the electricity grid in millisecond notice. Um, and this graph here on the right hand side is what it looks like. It's all happening in fractions of a second. Um, instead, we can offer fast response of electricity demand. So that's generally where you trip off that pump or cement mill within a millisecond. Um, and that has huge and tremendous value to air grid. Uh, next slide. Um, so where that is, is on the on this slide, left hand side, DSU, as it's generally referred to in the market or demand response that's slow, is where you manually or automatically res uh, respond within 60 minutes of an instruction to reduce your demand, be it by generation or, or switching off load. And you want to maintain that reduction for between two and six hours. And that the revenue for that is about 20,000 euros per megawatt. On the middle there, there is electric, uh, DSU or fast response. So this is where you respond in less than a second. Now, no human would be able to do that. So we've got to put an automated system, which is looking at the system frequency and will automatically respond if something happens on the grid. Um, and really the only options for that are batteries or reducing demand. A generator that's offline couldn't respond in the milliseconds that we're talking about. And what we want you to do then is to uh, maintain that reduction for between 90 seconds and one hour. The longer you can maintain it, the better, but revenue can be unlocked for as short as 90 seconds. And you'll see there's much more revenue available for that between 70,000 and 110,000 per megawatt, depending on the exact nature of how you're gonna deliver the demand reduction. And then the final one is market arbitrage. So this is where we are looking at the electricity market and understanding variations in the electricity price and getting you to move your um, load from daytime into nighttime using a battery. So <clears throat> um, at its simplest, you can think of it as if your company has a day rate and a night rate, well, then what we'd be doing is getting you to charge up your battery during the night when power is cheap and using that battery during the um, day when the electricity is expensive. And therefore, you've moved a bunch of costs from uh, an expensive time to a cheap time. Um, and there's lots and lots of revenue. You can see here's sort of a breakdown of the different programs that we operate in to unlock the revenue. And what I guess this is showing is it does not matter what response you're capable of doing, we're gonna be able to find a home for it for you and uh, earn as much money as we can um, for your business um, through the demand response that you're able to provide. Mark, do you wanna go ahead? Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Patrick. Um, so, yeah, pa Patrick's giving you a great overview there of the um, of the current uh, demand side mechanisms in place. What I'm going to do for now is just give, give you an overview of the wider semi electricity market and uh, how it's going to evolve over the next ten years to give you a flavour of what 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 uh, what's the future for demand side, side management. So, I guess the um, we will touch on this is essentially the transmission network for, for Ireland. You'll see is in the uh, in the in the red and orange is the high voltage transmission network. 
blue is a 220 network. What you'll see is the uh, a lot of the wind um, generation is in the west west of the country, while a lot of the demand centers and cities are on the on the east. So the challenge for the transmission system is to get the power from the um, from from the west to the east. Obviously, then as well, you've got the thermal generation sets dots dotted in red there, and we'll see we'll see what, what happens to them over over the next ten years. The uh, it's obviously also important to talk about the gas network because uh, gas is a large uh, part of the SEM. And again, we'll talk about that in more detail in a few slides. But it's just important to, to for context that uh, that yeah we're reliant heavily on uh, on gas from uh, Moffat in Scotland to to supply those uh, gas stations. Um, and just for context too, the uh, the market and system uh, operations obviously abide by certain rules. So you've got the trade and settlement code there for the for the market, the capacity market code for the capacity market, and then the grid codes for uh, operating and transmission system. So they're basically setting out the rules for, for how uh, generators, demand side units, etc., operate. And uh, just just to get us to 2020, we just look at a high level overview of what's happened over the last three decades to get us to where we are today. So if you look back at 1990. The uh, gas was actually quite a small part of the uh, overall um, electricity portfolio. Uh, uh, coal and oil actually dominated with, with renewables being a tiny percentage. And over, over the last um, 20 years, 10 years in particular, gas, gas has sort of stabilized, but renewables have really taken off. And that's, that's basically been uh, because of the policies that the, the governments in Ireland and Northern Ireland rolled out to, to, to move the market in, in, in that direction. So that's that's where we are today. Um, the policies the policies to date have only got us to 2020. So what we're really looking at, and uh, in, in the slide is where, how we get how we get further on to 2030. So up until recently, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of ambiguity around how you'd actually get to the 2030 targets. Paris Agreement was obviously published in 2016 and set out the the high level uh, um, uh, ambition, but it wasn't until uh, June 2020 that the uh, National Energy Climate Action Plan was released in Ireland. Obviously, the uh, National Development Plan in 2021, um, Climate Action Plan in 2021, um, path, network, path, path to Net Zero Energy in Northern Ireland in December 2021 were all published. And they they, they laid, laid down the uh, framework for getting to 70% uh, renewables on the, on the grid by 2030. The uh, National Development Plan actually goes further and uh, with an ambition of getting to 80% renewables on the grid by, uh, by, by, by 2030. And that all aligns with what the TSO, Airgrid and Sony are uh, aiming for with their shape in our electricity future, um, uh, which was published in October last year. And these documents all set out um, a pathway that wasn't there up until up until recently of how we would actually move towards um, 2030. So um, just in terms of, 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 of to get to look at 2030, I guess it's important to look at where we are today. So th this is essentially the fuel mix um, uh, in 2020. 2021 data is not just yet published, but um, so you can see your, you can see there gas and renewables are the main uh, um, fuel mix, main uh, participants in the fuel mix in in in, uh, in SEM. Gas over 50% and renewables, which is mainly wind, uh, at over 40%. Um, and this this uh, Shanky diagram is very similar, but uh, rather than percentages, you can see it in um, uh, kilotons of oil equivalent. And obviously, then on the on the other side of the diagram. Where what the main energy users are, so that'll obviously uh, shift from from 2020 to 2020 to 2030. Um, but both those diagrams, I guess, are uh, presented in a average figures across the year. So it's important to look at daily figures as well. So this is just a snapshot at the bottom of um, of, of a month uh, from mid December to mid January, and it sort of shows the variability day to day. Patrick already discussed about the demand uh, curve moving moving up and down. You can see the the, uh, the zeniths sort of in the middle of the graph there over Christmas. What you also see is the uh, renewables, mostly wind, um, uh, climbing up and down as the day it stays going. And it's important to note the, the green green is obviously um, green's renewables. There, the, the the size mightn't be great on, on your screens, but uh, the blue is the gas. And what you, what you'll see there is the blue doing a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of providing the flexibility to facilitate that uh, to facilitate those renewables. So. Again, we'll touch on this slide, uh, diagram later in the presentation. So um, to, that, that's 2020. So the next slide looks at 2030. And the Airgrid and Sony published the generation capacity statement. They, always, they, they also published the shaping our electricity futures. Both those documents set out a um, good idea of what, what the TSO view, the uh, generation portfolio looking like in 2030. So this, this graph is of today, and it essentially shows 
uh, or in orange, the, um, the gas generation around the island, mostly located quite close to cities and large, large energy site users. The uh, black is coal. Um, you see there in red, the peat stations in the Midlands and uh, the blue, that large blue is, is obviously Turlock Hill. And then you've got a lot of uh, wind in primarily in the, in the west of the country. Um, yeah, well, that's, that's just the, the um, information. So 2030, that will obviously say that's fundamentally changing. So what we, what we see in, in 2030 is obviously new interconnection um, to, to um, England, to the UK, and also to, to, to France. You also see a lot of um, offshore uh, wind being developed off the east coast of Ireland. Um, uh, retirements of all of the uh, coal, oil, and peat portfolio and obviously a lot more um, uh, onshore wind as well. But on red dots, you'll also see the uh, solar becoming more and more prevalent on the grid. Currently, there's quite a low solar um, on the grid. Uh, but to, to, to actually build out that, how, how do we get to 2030? Um, it, it's essentially going to be driven in the, in the first five years of, 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 the, of the decade, the growth in onshore, um, on, onshore wind and, and solar. With a huge uptake in uh, offshore wind going out to uh, going out to 2030, which is fundamentally a big, a big massive change for the, for the system. Um, and as part of that as well, what you see is the the black, the large black dots, um, the coal coal and oil as well as the peat generation portfolio being removed, and that's essentially plant retirements. So the capacity market is changing in 2025, um, essentially. Uh, Units that are, are using fuel that's de deemed unclean, such as coal, peat, uh, and oil, uh, will no longer receive um, capacity payments. So those plants will retire. So although you've got all this uh, solar and wind uh, coming onto the system, you also got a lot of thermal plant retiring, which is likely uh, um, lead to to uh, capacity shortages, which will obviously require um, flexible assets to uh, come in to, to resolve those issues. We we'll touch on that again. So. Um, to, to see the value that demand side management can provide, I, I, the next thing we look at is, is, the, is the markets. So there's three fundamental markets and the same as Patrick touched on earlier, energy, capacity, and system services. Now, energy market is essentially, you're paid for energy produced in 30 minute intervals. And currently that market's worth about 2 billion to persistence. The capacity market, you're, pay, you're basically paid on an obligation to provide uh, 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 your generation availability across the year. Um, that market's worth about 350 million to participants at, at present. And then the final one is the system services that, that were Patrick discussed earlier. There's 14 services ranging in categories from reserve, ramping, and airship and voltage support. And again, this market is increasing in value all the time. It's currently capped at 235 million, but it's projected to grow significantly into the future. So we look we look at those in more detail over the next few slides. So um, next slide, we'll just look at the current generation portfolio in 2020. To see what's actually going to happen uh, looking out to 2030. And first, the first uh, graphic here is a pie chart of the capacity market looking out to 24, 25. Um, you can see gas generation is uh, making up a huge part of it. 4.8 uh, gigawatts of, of, of contracted derated capacity is uh, gas. D DSU is actually the second largest uh, technology at 0.04, despite heavily he being heavily derated. And that'll increase into the future as, 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 as the uh, as the market uh, evolves. Um, looking at the thermal plant, um, thermal plant is aging in Ireland. You'll see there um, over 30% of the plant are over 30 years old. So almost 20% of the plant of, of the generation capacity actually over 40 years old, which is uh, you know those are the those are primarily the units uh, looking to retire in the next few years. And the, the issue with this is is, is, is that um, availability rates have been going down year on year. So Availability rates are, are, were averaging around 85, 80, 80, 86 percent right up until 2017. We've seen a huge drop off of that uh, in recent years. And along with uh, lower availability rates, you'll see the uh, forced outage rates increasing, where units are forced out at short notice. And all of this creates further uncertainty for the system operator, what they have to manage, and requires um, more and more flexible plant to, to overcome those technical challenges. Um, just to top, to top off that as well, the uh, demand set to increase significantly um, out to 2030. So uh, that's projected to increase by 30% um, over that 10 year period from 2020 to 2030. So you've uh, got plant retiring, uh, forced outage rates and availability um, going up and down respectively. 
and increased demand, which all leads to requirements for additional flexibility. So um, we, we've seen there natural gas is a huge part of the uh, current uh, fuel mix. So we'll focus in on that in this slide. And you'll see that um, natural gas is, is over 50% of the fuel mix in, 20, in, in um, 2020. Now, as we touched on one of the early slides, we're heavily reliant on uh, gas imports from, from Moffat in Scotland to supply the large uh, gas generation stations in Ireland. On top of that, we do have um, some indigenous gas coming in in Cork, but that, that's scheduled to uh, ramp down over the next few years. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's ramping down year on year. So we'll rely more and more heavily on uh, imports from Scotland. Um, and just to put into perspective, th these are the fuel prices that ho ho at for um, non-household non customers, the first half of 2021 across Europe. So this is European Commission's data that shows that Ireland is one of the highest uh, gas prices um, in, in Europe. And then obviously the, the, um, the, the, only a small part, proportion of that is tax. The rest is made up on, uh, of, 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 of gas prices driven by the wholesale market and because we're on the, on the tail end of a pipeline from, from Scotland. Um, so that's, that obviously creates an issue when you're, you're relying on 50% of your, of your um, fuel mix being coming from, from gas, gas generation. So this, this, again, just to set in context, everybody knows fuel prices went up in 2021 significantly. That's been driven heavily by the price of gas going up and also the price of CO2 going up. So more and more flexible technologies that um, can get away from, 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 gas, from uh, using gas and uh, not having to pay um, CO2, the better. So uh, this all plays into the hands of flexible assets such as DSM and storage. Um, renewable generation. So we look at the other side of this pie chart now with renewables. So renewables was 42% um, in, in, in 2020. And obviously a lot of that was wind. Um, so wind is growing year on year. And this was basically due to the, um, the incentives to, to, to get to the 2020 target. So the market design was incentivizing, incentivizing wind. Um, and th this is only in Ireland. Uh, the Northern, Northern Irish wind is tall is in, in this table as well. So you can see the, the total capacity across all Ireland is even greater than that in that chart. Um, so uh, in terms of in terms of uh, re renewables, um, wind is the wind is the lar is the second largest in, the, in terms of fuel mix. It's actually the largest in terms of uh, installed capacity, um, for far away in uh, gas. So um, the, the the flip side of that is. Although there's thousands of megawatts of, of uh, wind built, the reality is uh, wind comes with a capacity factor. So you see across the year, uh, month to month, the wind uh, performing um, sometimes well, such as February, or high, very high wind month, and sometimes low, such as April, which was down to 18%. So across the year, um, it was 28% uh, capacity factor in SEM for wind in, in uh, 2020, which um, is, is good, at, good at times, but obviously uh, creates a lot of uncertainty when the wind's not there. Um, so we will bring up we're bringing in more solar in 2030, but the, the capacity factors in solar in Ireland are even less. So you can see there um, peaking at 24 percent in May, but um, yeah, in 20 in 2020 we had uh, we had as low as three percent in December. So again, um, 13 percent average across the year. So the capacity factor for wind and solar, um, although there's huge 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 volumes of it being installed out to 2030, the capacity factors of these technologies are such that we need um, flexible technologies to, to basically uh, uh, allow the system to operate. Um, you know, hydro, hydro as well, the hydro plant is, very, is aging. It's only a small percentage, 2.4% of the fuel mix there in 2020. So the, the other challenge obviously then is curtailment and constraints. So we talked, we touched on the last slide about, um, about capacity factors, but the other, the other piece is curtailment and constraint, which is published in this report. A lot of the wind is uh, in, in west, while a lot of the demand center is in east. And you can see there uh, constraint and curtailment. So uh, constraint is essentially um, technical constraints. It's basically capacity on the network to, uh, to move the power from one side of the island to the other, while uh, curtailment is um, a system-wide uh, limitation on the amount of uh, asynchronous generation that can be facilitated at a time. Uh, we'll touch on that later. Uh, but what you can see is constraints relatively stable across the day, while constraint um, packs wind overnight where there's low demand, while when there's higher demand, you, you, you've less of this issue. But again, more flexible assets required to manage the, uh, the curtailment issue. And that's obviously the same data across the year, but uh, it's, it's driven low wind months, uh, curtailment isn't an issue, while in high wind months it is. 
and you've got very similar uh, issues with solar apart from the time of the day is very different. So solar only generates uh, in, in daytime or daylight hours. So you've got no curtailment or constraint in daytime hours. And obviously it, it comes in at um, comes in at during the day, less curtailment simply because there's less solar uh, installed. So it's not all coming on at the one time, there's less, less of it. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's the same principle in terms of um, technical constraints and constraint, uh, curtailment as, as, as wind. So th those challenges will have to be overcome um, and the only way to overcome them is, is, is introduction of system services. The TSOs have already introduced the services that Patrick had touched on earlier. The uh, 14 services that uh, remunerate for uh, reserve, ramping, inertia, et cetera. So th those services have been out since 2019, but there, there's a long way to go to, uh, to get uh, sufficient flexibility on the system to manage the, the network for 2030. So what we see here is basically the gate one system services from 2019. The values are quite small, but uh, it's just for context. Uh, the uh, the graphs on the next slide will, will show you the actual details. But what, it, what it's essentially saying is that there is um, there's a certain volume already contracted, and the system operator are recontracting additional capacity every six months uh, to, to 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 meet the requirements. Um, what you'll see here is the uh, over the four gates um, between 20, 2019 and 21 extra capacity coming on year on year. Now, this is additional capacity on top of the conventional capacity, it's which whose contracts would have rolled over from the prior arrangements to system services. What you can see there is um, the volumes increasing through gate one, gate two, gate three, gate four, etc. And uh, what, that, what, that, what that essentially means is there's more money coming into system services all the time, which is great. But on the flip side of that, um, the TSO did publish a document that some of you may be aware of around tariff rate adjustments at, towards the end, tail end of last year. The tariff rate adjustments essentially said that the TSO were um, they were being cautious to prevent over expenditure of their of their budget, which is 235 million, uh, because of the additional uh, fast acting services contracted in Gate Four, which is 128 megawatts. But um, what, what they've essentially done is that they've um, they've just uh, pulled back the rates for these four fast acting services, Core Sewer, Tour One, and FFR, by 10%. Now, if you look at the forecasted expenditure, what, what, what they've actually done is um, they pulled back the rate, but the forecasted expenditure for these services is still higher. The reason for that is the higher um, the higher the SNSP is, which we'll touch on later, the, it's a, um, the higher the scalers are for these services. So although the rates have been pulled back, and that's the big headline, you know, the, the headline story is the rates have been pulled back, the actual payment um, across the years actually increased because the um, the, uh, the scaler pushes it back up. So there's still a lot of money in system services. And uh, yeah, when you when you look, look, look beneath the bonnet, there's, uh, there's still a very clear incentives there that there's flexibility required. And uh, those are just the published rates. So again, they were, they were shown in uh, Patrick's slide earlier. Um, so in terms of um, future system service providers, um, th these are essentially the, uh, the break, a breakdown of just uh, cherry pick three of the services. So primary operating reserve tour one and ramping margin one, all three services can be provided by, um, by demand side management and storage. What you can see there is conventional generators whose contracts were carried across from the prior system service arrangements before 2019 still dominate the market. They provide 90% uh, of, uh, of, of the ramping margin and uh, over 60% of the uh, primary operating reserve. So DSUs wind to a certain extent Interconnectors and batteries are the other providers. Uh, DSUs are very strong at providing these services. Uh, battery, this, this information is actually outdated. It's, it was last updated in April 2020, so that was gate two. So batteries have increased their volume as well as DSUs in uh, gates three and four. But uh, the markets are totally dominated by, by conventional, and that's where the, the TSO acquire most of their services today, today. But as we've seen in the previous slides, there's a lot of conventional units um, uh, um, retiring and there's other conventional units uh, needing to be offline more to facilitate wind. So TSO will need to uh, get some services from new providers. So in this doc and um, in this document uh, uh, here, 2030 volumes, TSO looks at the uh, at the, the various technologies um, that can provide these services. And good news for most of us on this call today, um, demand side response and storage are outlined as being essentially the, the strongest providers of these services. So, uh, interconnection can provide some of the fast acting services, not, but not many others. And obviously gas turbines can provide the longer services, but the uh, the market's not really incentivizing 
um, CCGs to build at the minute. So there, there's huge opportunities here for uh, demand side response, um, both industrial um, and, and you know future technologies, CVs, etc., and long long duration storage and short duration storage to provide these services. Um, again, this is this is getting into the detail, but um, to look at the 2030 volumes, the TSO have also come out with um, portfolios that they believe meet the uh, real time requirements in 2030 based on based on the variables that we've seen from the additional wind and solar. What they've essentially done is they built three scenarios. One is uh, uh, very gas gas turbine led, where there's a lot of gas storage, uh, new gas storage built, but obviously also uh, lesser volumes of DSM and storage. Um, a demand led uh, scenario where it's all DSM and storage, and then a hybrid where it's a mix of the two. And what you'll see here is the contracted capacity cap uh, capability in 21 is the purple line, while the um, the three portfolios, uh, portfolio one, two, and three are these um, additional lines on the left-hand side. What you'll see is the contracted volume today is tiny compared to the contracted volume required in 2030 to manage the uh, real-time requirements. And we'll see that in the next uh, slide and the next graph where the real-time requirement is set out. And it's obviously for the fast acting services, it's linked to the largest single in feed, but to actually manage it in real time, the TSO were required to have available huge volumes of services to manage that, the uncertainty. So again, this is really good news for um, providers such as DSM and storage because it's very clear that there is um, there's a, there's, there's a market for for the services um, and then this just just to begin to conclude conclude in this section of the presentation uh, 2030 uh, outlook is also uh, pr presented here and it's essentially moving from 75 percent SNSP limitation today SNSP is essentially wind plus solar plus imports divided by demand response and exports essentially percentage of asynchronous generation on the system at any one time. To meet the 2030 targets, um, Airgrid are looking to move that to 95%, which is very challenging, but they've been very clear that they, uh, the, that they believe conventional generation need to uh, move, up, move, move away, and that the, uh, the flexibility will be provided by renewables, DSM storage, and other uh, unproven technologies. Um, again, this is just uh, how variable SNSP is. It's just a snapshot over a six month period from 2021, we see the huge variability. And again, this, this leads to uh, the need for flexible flexible assets. The system will be running a uh, much lower inertia on the system in, 20, in 2030. What that means is the, uh, the system will be lighter and these frequency events will become quicker unless the system operator do something about it. So again, they'll be looking to provide to contract huge volumes of uh, fast acting services. But more importantly, we we'll go back to this last, um, this, this slide, or this graph that we showed at the start, and that looks at the um, variability day to day. What we see here is uh, large fall offs of wind. This is 2021 data. 20 to 30 is going to be dramatically more as, as, as the uh, volume of renewables increases. So the, um, you essentially need uh, batteries, DSM, to, uh, to, 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 meet, to meet that requirement where the wind falls off pretty quickly. The opposite can also happen where the wind can pick up very quickly and uh, generation or demand needs to, to back off to facilitate that. You've got periods of very high wind where um, you need to get your flexible, uh, you, you need to get your flexibility from assets other than thermal generation because the thermal generation will be offline. And then obviously you've got the, uh, the last one where you've got very low, um, lo low levels of wind for prolonged periods of time where you need storage or, or demand side to um, essentially pick up the pieces there when there, when there is no, um, when there is no uh, renewable generation. So that, that's, that's just an overview of, of the market and uh, the need for flexible um, assets such as demand side and storage. So um, I'll hand back to Patrick now, bring us back to, to 2020 and talk about um, the um, needs today. And that, that's just context as to where it's going in the future. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, I mentioned earlier that I, I, um, I like graphs and uh, for those of you who like graphs, I'm sure yeah, that that was a good, good spell. But I suppose what it's really what we're trying to show is we're thinking deeply about this opportunity, where it's going, um, and on the evidence that we're seeing, that's why we're investing in this space. Um, we believe that electricity demand response has a huge part to play in keeping the electricity grid uh, going over the next few years, and and it creates a huge opportunity. Um, for many of you on this call. So 
The next uh, section is I'm going to chat about, well, what is the opportunity right now? Um, what can you do right now? So uh, first of all, I'll show you a few examples of um, real life um, organizations and how, much, how they're doing, how much they're making um, from participating in this type of program. So the first one is a chilled food store. And this is sort of the classic poster child of what electricity demand response should be all about. Um, uh, uh, fridges can be switched off. Uh, so this is like a warehouse, which is um, uh, also a fridge, uh, keeping, its, uh, keeping food cold for long periods of time. Um, and they can switch off their chillers for um, uh, one or two hours without it um, bringing the temperature outside of the tolerance that is acceptable to them. So they have 500 kilowatts of chillers, which are running all the time, um, where they can manually switch off the chillers. Um, that's worth 10,000 euros to them. So that's where they install no new equipment and their staff switch off the chillers when we call on them to do so. They earn 10,000 euros. If they can automatically switch off the chillers, so allow us to send a signal to their chillers to switch them off, then that revenue grows by 35,000 euros. A huge opportunity for uh, a site like this, a huge difference to their margin. And as I said, with no measurable effect, negative effect on their um, business. Um, the next opportunity would be an industrial site a site which has a backup generator, for example, um, which could be switched on for up to six hours. It's rare that it would be needed for six hours, but we need to know that that's possible. That would be worth that site um, if it was a one megawatt um, load, which could be displaced and moved on to generator, would be worth them about 20,000 euros. Again, this is a manual example where they're going to do the switching themselves and no significant change to their electrical setup would be required. The only thing we need to do is to install um, metering on that generator so that we can see how much load there is on site and when they switch on the generator, how much load is gonna be taken off the grid. Um, because that's fundamentally what we're offering um, uh, AirGrid as a service. Now, I saw there was a, a, a mention in the chat, a question about what are, is the de minimis level that we can work with. Um, I suppose, so we're what's called an aggregator. We bring together many, what would be considered small loads um, uh, and bring them together. So actually in the image here, you can see a hotel. Um, so to give you an example, sometimes a hotel might have a load of 200 kilowatts. Um, that could be switched over to backup generator. The vast majority of hotels have backup generators and that um, would be worth them about 4,000 euros of a payment. The limit on us as to what is a site that we will work with um, really comes down to the cost of implementing the project. So as I said, we just need to have metering installed so that we can see in real time what the load is on the site and what would happen if we switched over to generator. But other than that, that's the really where the limit comes, uh, comes uh, for us. Um, uh, the next example um, would be a high value manufacturing site with a, a site with a large load. So what you find is very often these larger sites, they have a combination of the types of loads that uh, I, I refer to. So this one, which has a chiller of 500 kilowatts, um, uh, would be able to manually switch it and um, earn 10,000 euros. If they had a backup generator, let's say two megawatts, again, manually controlled by their own staff, that would earn them another 40,000 euros. And I suppose the exciting opportunity that um, is really coming online and we're beginning to deploy now is batteries, where a site might deploy a one megawatt battery and that would be an automatically controlled device. So the battery would be responding to system frequency and acting quickly to help smooth the grid and keep it going um, uh, when there's a frequency event, but also providing that site with far better quality of electricity and security of supply. 
they'd also be earning about 110,000 euros for that one megawatt battery. So a huge opportunity there, totaling about 150K in revenue for participating in a program uh, like ours. So um, great, great opportunity for a site like that. So, so I suppose um, what this slide is showing you on the left-hand side, we have sort of how demand response works now. Um, whereby you look at what loads could you um, reduce, um, what generators could you switch on. And usually what we do when we're working with a site is we deploy what's called our clarity software. So that's whereby um, we deploy many meters or we work with the existing meters that are on site and help give visibility to the site about their electricity consumption generally. So that's sort of where things are right now. Um, where we're trying to build towards is to help customers manage their electricity as things get more complex and there's more new technologies being deployed on site. So the types of things that we can speak to you about, but I think you know are coming down the line are CHPs, thermal storage, uh, battery storage, solar PV. I see there's a question about PV uh, in, in the comments heat pumps, uh, electric car charging. These are all new technologies. However, they're now technologies. They're things which people are really deploying now. And based upon what some of the things Mark's, Mark has said, I'm sure you're convinced that um, they're required technologies. We can help you figure out what of those could work within the electricity demand response sphere, help you de-cost some of these new technologies, get yourself a more secure um, electricity network, uh, uh, local network on your site and make sure that you're guaranteed um, clean power going forward. Um, so that's all we have to present to you now. Um, there's a, a question and answer box um, where- So where... I have uh, quite a few questions actually for you guys. Um, a, you've generated a lot of interest here. So I know we're a bit tight on time, so let's uh, start whizzing through them. So one of them, I think you may have answered it already, is there a minimum level for consideration of DSU, DSM, uh, since it's measured in megawatts and uh, one megawatts the minimum? Sure. So the short answer is we generally look at one to 200 kilowatt sites as the bottom of, of, that we, we look at. However, I'm happy to have a chat with that uh, questioner and see is there multiple sites similar uh, in, that they're talking about or how could we make it work for them? John, I can set that up. Um, I'll email you afterwards. And then we've, um, for the example on earnings, are they based on activation payments? So you get that payment every time since you provide that service. It's a good question. Sure. So the bulk of the revenue earned in the programs I've talked about are, are standing fees. They're money that you earn for being available to respond. And then the small portion of what you earn would be activation fees. And they're generally just targeted at covering your costs in being called upon. So the money is in being available to be called and the break even is in actually being called. We just uh, reimburse you so you're not out of pocket for that. So one was about EV. Do you see that coming live? You answered that already. Yes, you do. Um, and so here we go. Let's see. Volumes procured by AirGrid already seem high. How much capacity is left available to be added to the DSR in your estimate? Mark? Um, Mark. Yeah, um, the, the volumes procured already are high, but uh, the volumes that are disappearing uh, on, the other, on the other side from conventional generation are even higher. Um, the demand the demand curve is, is set to increase year on year with uh, with with um, data center growth as well as EVs and uh, heat becoming electrified. So the, there's there's more and more space for demand side um, growth. But I, I guess you need to break it into capacity. DSM and storage are, vi are very much needed uh, to to fill in the gap of thermal generation for capacity. While system services uh, towards the end of the presentation there, I, I sort of outlined the uh, system needs for 2030. And um, in the very short term, the, the, there's a lot of um, system services already already acquired, but uh, going out to 2030, the, the volumes that will need to be contracted will vastly outweigh, outweigh what's required today. 
Okay, and then um, how quickly can you get us going as part of the DSU DS3 schemes? Sure, for smaller customers um, in, the, in the region of less than one megawatt, we can generally get you up and running almost immediately. As quick as you're available, we can get you up and running. Uh, for larger customers, we need to procure more um, capacity from AirGrid. We need basically an allotment from AirGrid to deliver that capacity. Um, so then in those cases, we need to have a chat with you and understand what exactly you have available. And, and that will give us guidance on how, how we can get it on the market as quickly as possible. Our interest is getting you up and running as quickly as possible. That's where we are in our revenue. Um, and a couple of hotel questions. Um, sorry, I suppose there, there, there's a lot of hotels don't have generators, uh, only really to run essentials. Um, and then what would be the cost of installing a generator that might be able to run a hotel by 200 plus bedrooms? Maybe we could set up a call afterwards with um, Jonas, yeah? Yeah, that would be the best. I'll email you after this, Jonas. Um, and then are the payments one-off or annual? They're annual. They're annual fees. They're yeah. annual earnings that you earn, yeah. How do you validate the data from meters already installed on site? Uh, so the Clarity software system that we have has been developed basically to allow it to interact with existing meters. So we've got experts who go and look at your existing metering and figure out what digital outputs can be tapped into, or if they're already feeding an online system, how we can have our database talk to your database to extract that data. And uh, you mentioned a battery. What do they physically look like and how big is the required footprint? Sure. So as a general rule, you can think of a battery as a truck container, uh, be it a full-size truck container or a half-size truck container that will be dropped beside your electrical switch room and wired into your electrical switch room in a very similar way to how a generator is. Um, and the difference being it's going to pull power from your system at night, and then it's going to give it back during the day when it's required. Stephen wants to know your thoughts on DERs. Uh, as an aggregator, would you be interested in battery assets, um, 50 to 100 kilowatts capacity? Can you um, see that question there in the chat? Uh, yes, we would. <laughs> it's the short answer. <laughs> and I'm looking at the time. I. Uh, aware that it, we're, we're running um, tight here now. And then a quick, one quick, one, the state or semi-state owned EV fleets, is there plans for these to be incorporated into the balancing of the grid? I'd assume, that, well. In, in future, uh, the, some, somebody will have to do that, but the, the state, the semi-state companies will be very unlikely to do that, but um, there's opportunities for aggregators, obviously, to come in and do that. And that's that's one of the areas that, that we'll be looking at is the aggregation of EVs in the medium to long term. And a key, key question, how often are we likely to be called as part of these schemes? Sure. So the number of calls has varied from year to year. And I suppose fundamentally, electricity demand response is the last line of defense. OK, so you can think of each time that we're being called as a time that possibly there would have been a power cut had we not been called, okay? So in the early years of electricity demand response, we were being called one to two times per year. In more recent times, we've been called more like 12 or 14 times in the year, um, which is much more. However, within the context of what we're doing, uh, you should really only be participating in this program if you're happy enough to run that asset. So be it switch on your generator or switch off your fridge for a short space of time. And as I said, within our uh, pricing system, we pay you a standing fee to be available, but then we pay you more to cover your costs each time you're called upon to run. So you won't be out of pocket for being called more often. Okay, last question. Do we have time for that, gents? Where we just do the, the last one or more? They're <laughs> popping in really quickly. Uh, could you provide details on your commercial methodology? Is it a recurring payment, percentage of demand response savings, etc.? cetera? Um, I have Brian's name here and email address. If you want me to set up a call or a chat, are you happy to answer? Well, a call is very welcome. But um, so generally speaking, um, 
we predict what your revenue will be from the, the system based upon what you tell us of your loads that you're making available. And then on an ongoing basis, we're monitoring to see, is that does that stay consistent? And we're feeding that information into the electricity market and getting paid by the electricity market for the load reduction that we or you are offering. And then you're getting a agreed percentage of that. So the lion's share of the money that comes out of the market goes to you and we just take a percentage to cover our costs. Um, and you earn money on an ongoing basis. So uh, generally speaking, we pay people on a quarterly basis or something like that. Um, you, you, you earn money. Um, and then you earn a little bit more if you've been called upon to, to reduce demand. Um, but if that's not clear, I apologize. Happy to go into it, it in detail with you at, at another time. Great. Well, guys, that was really, really interesting. Um, lots of great questions. Um, great audience. It was really good. Thank you all so much for your time. Um, we will be sending out a recording. Um, you all have my email address. Pop me an email if you want to set up a call with Mark or with Patrick. Um, Thank you very much.